hello everyone. So uh, welcome to the first uh, basic notion seminar of this academic year. It's my pleasure to introduce our colleague, Raf Kebauer. If you haven't met him yet, this is your chance to know what he does. And he'll tell us about using the computer as a microscope to understand materials. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, so hello, good afternoon, everyone. So this is for me really first, because I've never given, I've given many talks here in this auditorium, but never at uh, 5.30 in the afternoon, and never to a mathematics audience. So this is really a first for me. I never talk to a mathematics audience, so I might be with what I've prepared completely out of what you, what you expect or what you would like to see normally and so on. So because of this, I try to, to prepare something which is kind of a mixture. There are some equations, but they are mostly figures and some pictures and so on. So uh, it's all because I wasn't really sure where to place everything. So I'm very happy if you interrupt me or if you ask questions or if you tell me too slow or you know all this. So just uh, make it as informal as possible, okay? So what I would like to talk about is a subject which you might be interested in as mathematicians. Because as mathematicians, you should like numbers, I would imagine. And if you think about numbers and computers, one always hears about these big supercomputers, which are uh, some here in Europe, mostly, however, now in China and in the, UN, in the US. And one wonders, what are these supercomputers, in fact, calculating? Okay. So what these supercomputers are calculating is the first thing which comes to mind is probably the weather forecast. And this is true. And I remember some years ago when I did my PhD, I was using one of the supercomputers at the time. And there was always in the afternoon around 4.30 a time when the national, it was in France at the time, when the national weather forecast for the next day was calculated and all our jobs were stopped and then the weather forecast was calculated and then at a certain time when the weather forecast for the next day was ready, we could continue doing it. Okay, so the supercomputers are on one hand weather things, but then there are today mainly two other main users of supercomputers. One is also very much related to weather, a climate prediction, which today are very important. And also we have not a supercomputer, but we have kind of a, um, a smallish, medium-sized cluster here in ICTP. And also there, about half of this cluster is used by our climate group calculating um, climate prediction. So this is one thing. And the other thing is what I will be talking about. It's um, um, materials, materials related computations in the mo broadest uh, sense. So this is in fact one of the big number crunching activities is what I would like to show you here. Okay? So I've written in the title that um, we use the computer as a microscope to look what happens in, in a material. I will try to explain you with some examples a little bit better what, uh, what I mean with this. But uh, let me start in a very informal way and let me start with a picture, okay? So here is a gentleman. Any one of you has an idea who this is? No, no one knows this gentleman. This is beginning of the 20th century. No, so I show you a different picture where he is younger and then you will, re yeah, it is Edison, in fact. So on this younger picture here, you probably recognize him, not because his face is so different, but because he holds in his hand the light bulb, okay, which he's invented. So I'm not showing this because for a microscope, which I've promised you, one needs light to see something, but because I would like to talk about the light bulb and his invention and mainly how he invented it, okay? So if you think about a light bulb, you know, in the interior of the light bulb, there's a filament. Electrical current flows through the filament and it glows and it produces this light. And now Edison had the challenge to find out which is a suitable material to use as a filament in the light bulb he wanted to produce. And for some reason he has decided that the most probable good candidates are carbon-based materials. So what he did is he was testing all kinds of carbon-based materials he could uh, get a hand on. He used, for example, um, um, wood from all kinds of different trees in the US. He used uh, filaments of other plants. He used coconuts. He even used 
hairs of the beard of a laboratory assistant, which he had. So it, he used kind of all kinds of materials he could put into a filament and try to make it glow in a light bulb. It was a huge endeavor. It took more than two years. And it was also a huge logistic effort because he asked people all over the United States to send him all kinds of plants, products, where one could extract a filament from. And by trying out many, many, many different things, he finally settled on carbonized, um, on, on a carbonized uh, cotton thread. So what, what we have today in our, our clothing, carbonized and used that as a filament, and it worked. However, so this was, in my opinion, or it's probably the first time that someone did a screening for materials. He used a huge array of different materials as for this intended usage, and he finally settled on the one which he found best. Material screening is something which goes on and on and on and has, to, until today, still the most important source of inventing a new material for a given purpose. In fact, so Edison, he was rather wrong because, as I said, he settled on the fact that it should be a carbon-based material for his filament. But just a few years later, someone else proposed tungsten as a filament, which works, in fact, much, much better. And until today, those uh, light bulbs which are still around, they are all based on filaments with tungsten. So in the end, in fact, all his search for material was, in a sense, misguided by his first assumption that it should be some carbon-based filament. Okay? So why am I talking about a search for materials? Well, because this is one of the applications of this computational microscope which I would like to talk about, okay? So imagine you are in a situation you would like to develop something new, perhaps not a light bulb, but perhaps a, a drug for a given illness, or you would like to, to produce a new photovoltaic panel or something. So you know, you look for a material with a given property, and then you try out many, many, many things. And this is very often very expensive, and in fact, industry is spending huge amounts of money to do this. An example might be finding a catalyst for a given reaction. For example, you want to produce fertilizers, and then until today, one uses iron-based catalysts for the Haber-Bosch reaction, which produces fertilizers. It's a huge industry. And also, that was a catalyst which was found by Haber and Bosch by a search like this. Now one could save a lot of money if one didn't have to produce all these materials and send um, people to send you in from all corners plants or something like this. If one could find out what is interesting just by doing some computations on a computer. And I will show you one of the modern examples of uh, how this can be done here. So here people have been looking for photovoltaic panels. I'm starting with this example because I'm working a lot in renewable energy and so on. And this was at the time when it was published um, and quite a famous case of a computational screening of materials. So what did people try to do? So they f tried to find a material which is best suited to produce a photovoltaic panel other than the silicon panels we all know already. So what I've shown here is on this axis you see energy, and here on top I've, um, um, is the solar spectrum. So this indicates for each energy how much energy is irradiated on the Earth's surface by the sun. Okay? So at the same time, so this obviously depends on the energy, and there are certain frequencies there where there's no light because of absorption in the atmosphere, and uh, you have this spectrum. So you would like to transform this into electricity, into energy. And uh, this is used, uh, normally done with the semiconductor materials. And semiconductor materials are characterized by something which we physicists call an energy gap. The energy gap in this context essentially means a minimum energy, and you can collect the, the photons, the solar light, only for energies larger than the gap. So in a sense, therefore, the gap, this energy gap for a good material should be as low as possible to capture as much sunlight as possible. But the gap also must not be too low, because the difference between the photon which comes onto your material and the gap, this is a pure loss. So the gap should not be too low, because you have too many losses. It shouldn't be too large, because you do not absorb the light. Okay? And uh, so these people have done a computational screening of many materials, and they calculated something which they call spectroscopically limited maximum efficiency. It doesn't matter. It's a measure they calculated which indicates what will be the efficiency of a solar panel made out of it as a function of the gap, which they also calculated. And this is the result which they got. So here you have a line. This indicates as a function of the gap what is theoretically the 
possible maximum, this is called the Schottky Weiser efficiency limit, the theoretically possible efficiency limit you can have. As I said, too large a band gap, you do not absorb anything. Too low a band gap, you have too many losses. And there's an optimal band gap you see between 1 and 1.5 um, electron volt would be a typical band gap. And then they did, uh, in the computer, they calculate many, many different materials. You see here, copper, gallium, ditelluride, and so on, so many materials, and each one gives a dot on this line. And amongst all these materials, now one can find out, ah, these here probably which are close to the top are those materials which are worth synthesizing in the laboratory and examining more. And in fact, before this computational study, some have already been known. For example, the copper indian diselenide and copper indian ditelluride, these have been known to be amongst the best materials for making these kind of solar cells. But for example, all these silver-based materials, they came out through this rather blind computational study. Is it, is it clear these materials so, no, this, so at that point they were just theoretical materials, but uh, they also calculated, it's not shown here, the stability. This is, I will show more in the second graph of stability. So the second example of which I want to show you when uses the computer to look into a material is this here. So people also, again, would like to absorb sunlight, in this case to produce um, hydrogen out of water. And they were screening materials which are of this type. This um, type is called um, perovskite materials. And perovskite materials are made out of two metals, which here are called A and B, which are in a cage-like structure like this. And then there is an octahedron of oxygen atoms like this. So the inner um, atom here is a metal B. Here we have a metal A. And we have oxygen here around. So this is a structure, ABO3. An example, a famous example, is lead titanium, um, would be here, this here, lead titanium uh, oxygen 3, might be one of this class of materials. And people have calculated with a computer, with the methods which I will explain. Um, first, what Fernando just said, how stable the material is. And they calculate for this the heat of formation. So one would like this to be as low as possible, to have as stable a material as possible. So one would like it to be in the red region. And they calculate, again, the energy gap, as before, for absorbing solar light. And as we've seen, one would like here, again, to be in the region which is, in this scale, red. So what have they done? They have uh, taken more than 3,000, I think it's 3,600 combination of these 60-something metals uh, for uh, the position A, or these 60, the same kind of metals for the position B in the perovskite, as I said before. And for each combination of A, B, O3, they calculate these two quantities. So you see for each combination here a little square. And if one looks more closely into what this is, then for each square they, have, they report two numbers the formation, um, the heat of formation, and the band gap. So they have, without f first needing to produce those, they had screened these uh, 3,800 or so materials, and they came out that promising candidates are those where you see where they put kind of a green uh, square around. So out of 3,600, they ended up with about 10 candidate um, perovskites, which might be good for this. So, this is a second example of something where people have used a computer to look at a huge amount of materials to find out what is promising. Just two examples out of my own kind of field, which is materials usable for renewable energy. So this is an era, as I've said, we are using a lot of computer time, not only for screening, but say more generally for, um, for doing this. And it is, in fact, also if you look at the number of papers published in this area and so on, one discovers that this is an area which is growing very, very fast. It's one of the fastest growing areas in physical sciences. And the question is why? So, in fact, there are two main reasons. One is, of course, one, everyone would have guessed this, computers today are much faster than computers some years ago. So we can do things which were impossible. For example, the computer on which I did my PhD was probably all the, the supercomputer together less powerful than my cellular phone today. So it is really incredible um, how fast computer power has increased so one can do many things. And also, everything has become much cheaper in the field of computation. And obviously, this is a big enabler of this field. The second is also 
even with the, the com if there had been no progress in the computers, today, fortunately, we are much cleverer. I will show you in some uh, minutes that, in fact, the task of calculating properties of a material is a very, very, very difficult task. I will show you why you are mathematicians, you will, you will understand. So it's a very difficult task, and there has been a lot of progress over the last, say, 20 years of how we can tweak the equations and make them more easy to handle in the computer. So the algorithms and the ways we approach the problem have become much better. Not the last, I will say this in a minute, also through many of improvements which have been invented here in Trieste. So Trieste is kind of a very important city for these kind of things, for new algorithms and approaches to this. Since I'm in ICTP and I'm speaking to this audience, I would also like to say that this computational material science is ideally suited for science in developing countries, in my opinion, because, as it said here, computers are cheap. Everyone today can have some computer and something one can do everywhere. And even for science where you need kind of a supercomputer, one only needs internet, and even internet is these days more and more available everywhere. So this is, in my opinion, some uh, reason why also ICDP is and should invest in these kind of things, because it is really an ideal way to do science and modern science also in, uh, in places where one cannot afford very expensive um, experimental equipment. Okay? So this is why it is growing so fast, but why is it useful? Well, the first thing is what I've said, the promise of new materials, industry here, there, money, uh, this is of course one thing. But the finding this computational screening, which I said, is just one point. It is, and it is, in my opinion, not even the, the most important point. The other things is that it allows a more, uh, say, a, a more profound understanding of what is happening. For example, Imagine some experimentalist has some material and sees some strange effect. Where it's unknown what this is due to. Simulating this material in the computer can either directly answer what it is due to, or one can tweak things which in nature you cannot do. For example, you, um, one thinks, what is this effect due to? Is this purpose due to relativity? Is this a relativistic effect? In an experiment, you cannot switch off relativity or something. But in a computer, you can switch on and off relativity and your relativistic effects. And in this way, you can answer questions which you cannot easily answer if you do not do it mathematically on a computer. Okay? And uh, I would say that what is done here in ICTP is mainly of this second sort. So when we are doing computation material science here, we are mainly doing it to understand certain materials and certain properties of matter. The third reason is also one can work with all kinds of difficult substances. Try to do an experiment on uranium or plutonium, and you will find out how difficult it is to do these kind of things. While in the computer, I have no problem of producing plutonium or uranium and <laughs> doing some calculations, which, in fact, I've never done. And my intention is not to work on radioactive substances, but so it's just to say also some other substances might be very toxic. Okay, so you can on a computer you can do it, and you you run no risk. So. Now I've kind of shown you what, uh, how nice it is, what one can do, what people have done, why it's ideal for everyone, but, but how is this done? How can we take a computer and calculate all this? And this is, in fact, the main, the main things I would like to tell you during this seminar. So how can we do um, computational material science? Okay? So let's start from the beginning and wonder, what is it? What is a material? So we want to understand properties, say, of this chunk of matter. So this here is a cartoon. It's a, a number of, uh, of atoms. In this case, we have red atoms and blue atoms, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And matter generally always is a mixture of different kind of atoms, like shown here with the different colors, plus electrons around them. Okay? So for all practical purposes, we can imagine that atoms which we have are essentially Point charges are charges which have really, for us, no structure. They are really like a point with a given electrical charge sitting on top of them. And a different atom will have a different charge. So since they are all positively charged, everything would fly apart. What keeps matter and us together are obviously the electrons, which are negatively charged. And the electrons are in a sea around, uh, around the atoms. They are creating chemical bonds, as you know. And the chemical bonds will make such that some atoms uh, are bound more or less uh, to the others, and so on. So this is what we would like to describe on a computer. 
For doing this, in fact, the world of computational material scientists is separated into two classes. One class of people do classical simulation. With classical simulations, one means that one takes this chunk of, oh, no, sorry, this was the wrong button. Here we are, so. One takes this chunk of matter we've just seen before, and one is not simulating electrons. Because the problem with electrons, as you will see later, is that they are quantum mechanical particles, and then there are many identical particles, and they have many properties which are, in a sense, difficult. So in these kind of classical models, one is throwing away electrons. One is treating only the nuclei as a classical particle, so each nucleus is well uh, defined by the charge, obviously, it has, and the position it has, and perhaps its velocity, if it is moving. And the role of electrons in these classical models is taken by empirical interactions. You can imagine them as if there were springs between the atoms and how strong the spring is might depend on obviously which kind of uh, atoms are close together, which other neighbors are there. Then there can be um, other interactions which depend on angles and so on. So one calls this a force field. So one replaces the electrons with, with some empirically fitted forces and force fields which give you an energy and which makes that everything ke is kept together. So these are classical models. It's pure Newton's equations which need to be solved. And if your um, force field is very good, you, one can do a lot of things. And this part here of the world is what is mostly used. So if you look, would do some statistics of how many people are doing A or the, uh, the other kind of simulation, this is mostly used because this is extremely useful and works very well in biology. And uh, as you know, there are many more biologists than there are physicists or chemists. And therefore, since this is such a huge community, automatically there are many, many more people doing this. So this is very useful. It's also in, in other materials, it's uh, used very much, but it is m its main application lies in things which are somehow related to proteins, to interactions of a drug, for example, with a, with a protein, with a, uh, where it goes also to medicine. And so, so in the most general way, I would say something somehow related to biology. The other part is quantum models, where one retains the electrons. So one does not kind of empirically fit something, but one tries to understand really what the electrons are doing quantum mechanically. So, okay? so this is in fact the, the field where I am working in, where I will talk a little bit more about it. And the advantage here is, of course, you do not need a force field. You do not need to have some a priori empirical fit of interactions and so on. And, uh, the price to pay is, however, that now you have to solve in the computer also what the electrons are doing. Okay? So you can imagine that if you do not have to solve for the electrons, but just solve some springs and some Newton's equation, you can treat really very large systems. Here, however, the systems are relatively smaller. What do I mean? Um, I will give you some numbers in a second. Here, however, in a force field, you will always have problems with chemistry. So, for example, if an atom goes away from it, if some chemical bond is broken, the electrons do funny things. And this is typically not well represented if you have some springs or some force field. So here, whenever chemistry happens, you cannot do anything. Also, if you are interested in something which depends on the electrons, like I've shown you for the photovoltaics, the properties of photoabsorption interaction with light, you need electrons to do this. This all is well described, however, in the quantum model. So people here, they can easily treat a million or several millions of atoms, no problem, in longer time scales. Here we treat typically 1,000 atoms or so. So this is just an order of magnitude to give you an idea. So it's really systems which are much larger in one world. Here we have much smaller systems. Okay? So now, your mathematicians are finding, what is the equation we have to solve? Okay? So what do we need to do to do the quantum part, the part where we retain also the electrons? Okay? So in fact, what we need to find is a so-called wave function. Now, I'm not going to give you a lesson about physics and what a wave function is. Let me just say a wave function is, in principle, a complex valued uh, function, which depends on the coordinates or, um, of all your, in this case, electrons. And we imagine we have NE electrons and the coordinates of all your nuclei, we have an N nuclei in our system. So we have to find a function which is defined 
um, by these coordinates. It's complex value and it's um, everywhere in space. Uh, later I will show you that there are some more important things, but in principle, so for if you do quantum mechanics, you need to find the wave function of your system. How is the wave function determined? Well, the wave function must obey a very simple equation, h psi is e psi. h is an operator acting on this function here. I will show it in a second. And this is an eigenvalue equation. What is typically important is only the lowest eigenvalue. So we are interested only in the ground state and the lowest eigenvalue of this eigenvalue equation, which gives you the ground state energy E and the corresponding eigenvector, which is this wave function. Now, H is um, the so-called Hamiltonian. It's an operator which translates the energy of your system. And in fact, it is not difficult. It's in fact a very easy operator. As I said, it represents the energy of your system. And if you look closely, so here in blue, these two parts are very easy. It, this is a kinetic energy. P squared is the momentum squared divided by 2m. This is just kinetic energy here for each nucleus. This is kinetic energy for each electron. So obviously, this is part of uh, the Hamiltonian. Then we have one part with a negative sign. So this is attractive because it's the Coulomb interaction between an electron and a nucleus. The nucleus at position Ri and the electron at position Ri. So this here gives you all the attractive interactions. And then you have two repulsive interactions between the nuclei. It's just Coulomb. And here again, between the electrons, also this is just Coulomb. It really looks very easy. This is just, um, you see, in fact, this operator here, the momentum operator, is in fact just a second derivative in space. Okay? So all you have here is a second order partial differential equation which you need to solve. It really does not look difficult. And why did I say it's a formidable task? The equations, it looks extremely simple. Yeah? But it is not. Why not? Because these beasts, these many body wave functions, they are really not nice. So we have to try to simplify it. And I should say, all I'm saying here is for non-relativistic physics. One can also do relativistic things where the equations are a bit different, but for us, this is already difficult enough today. Okay? Why is Ri never equal to Rj? Hmm? Why is the denominator never zero? Because, because electrons... Well, uh, so you should know that these are not numbers here. These are what we in quantum mechanics call operators, okay? So, and the wave function is never such that you have a very well-defined position in this thing. And uh, so when you integrate in the end in order to get your energy, you integrate over all the positions and uh, this, and the measure of where, uh, where this here becomes infinite is in fact um, uh, of measure zero. So it, uh, this does not really con um, contribute to, to the total energy. So this is not the problem. <laughs> the infinity here is not the problem. The problem, no, so let us try to make it easier. Here you have again the same Hamiltonian. And if you look at some parts are perhaps larger than others. First of all, look kinetic energy. In fact, if there was not the blue part here, then it would be very clear that the wave function looks like delta peaks in space because here the an eigenfunction of a position operator is obviously something which is a well-defined position. So the, the, the wave function would be something which is like a delta peak or a very narrow function around some positions. So everything would be very well-defined if you didn't have kinetic energy. The kinetic energy for being a second derivative, it forces the wave function to be broader and having this characteristic nature which you know from your chem chemistry courses where you know how an orbital typically looks like. Okay? So it is, in fact, what makes the system more quantum mechanical or more classical is, in fact, the strength of this part here in the Hamiltonian. And if you look at this part here, then you see that here we have always m, the mass of the electron. Here we have the masses of the nuclei. Now, electrons are much, much lighter than nuclei. In fact, even the lightest nuclei, which is uh, hydrogen, is about 1,000 times heavier than an electron. Okay? So because of this, one over a big M, and here one over a small M, makes such that probably this term here is less important than that term here, okay? just by looking at the orders of magnitude. In fact, this is very often the very first approximation anyone is doing when he's saying, okay, we do as if there was no kinetic energy of the nuclei. This is called also the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. 
This means, at the same time, as I said, all quantum effects of nuclei disappear if you do this, because it's, uh, quantum effects are introduced, in fact, by having a kinetic energy operator here. You can also say you're doing the H bar going to zero limit, some people call it like this. So, but anyway, so one does the classical approximation on the nuclei. So with this von Oppenheim approximation, we do not take this into account in the Hamiltonian, meaning we say all nuclei, they are like a classical particle with a well-defined position and they're sitting at one point and having just their Coulomb um, forces acting on the electrons. So this is the first approximation we are doing. And all which remains quantum mechanical are the electrons. Also, this is still difficult enough, okay? So now let's try to solve the problem for the electrons only, by the nuclei we claim are um, pure, uh, the nuclei we claim are purely classical particles which are sitting at a given point in space. So now I have to do a little bit of physics to show you where the difficulty comes from. The difficulty comes from trying to build a valid wave function for electrons. So how is a valid wave function built? I will show you, say a bit more about it. So first of all, if you have n e electrons, okay, then let us choose n e complex functions in space. So these single particle orbitals are simply complex functions every, at every point in space. And we require that of this function that it is um, square normalizable, so it's normalized to one. And also, we to take n e for them, one for each electron. And we also want that they are orthogonal. So um, their scalar product should be or must be zero. So you take n e um, orbitals for n e electrons, and you try to build a wave function from that. This is done by building a so-called slatter determinant, which looks like this. Okay? So you have n e orbitals. And a determinant, so this is what I call with a capital phi, a determinant now for NE electrons would be simply this. So you all know, you're mathematicians, you know very well what a determinant is. Just say this here is a function which looks like, for example, phi 1 of R1, phi 2 of R2, and so on, times phi n of Rn. But then there are plus, minus, all kind of combinations. Why is this necessary? It's necessary because the laws of quantum mechanics tell us that a valid n fermion wave function must be such that if you exchange two particles, you must have a minus sign in front of it. And a determinant perfectly satisfies this. So a determinant, having a determinant character of your wave function is in fact a sufficient condition that your func wave function is valid. But obviously, I mean, it depends on what you have chosen as single particles. And uh, being a determinant is not a necessary, uh, so sorry, it is not um, necessary, so the real wave function is not necessarily just one determinant. In general, it is never. So the real many body wave functions which we are looking at will be some linear combination of all possible determinants you can imagine for your n electrons. Okay? So what you need to determine if you want to solve the electronic problem is you have to determine for all existing determinants what is the prefactor? This determines what is the many electron wave function. Okay? So now, why is this so complicated? The reason is because, not because a determinant is a complicated object. No, it's only complicated in LaTeX until you have it there, but it's not difficult to handle. What is difficult is that there are so many, many, many possible determinants. And the reason why there are so many possible determinants is the same reason as why we are not all millionaires, because it's related to choosing a small number out of a big number. So if you play in a lottery, you have to choose, I don't know, six numbers out of 50 uh, other numbers, and you never win because you never get those numbers right. Here you have the same. So you have to choose n e orbitals, okay, out of a, sh a huge number of orbitals. And choosing this is something which grows factorially fast. So you have a, a huge, huge number of possibilities to choose these orbitals amongst all possible orbitals. And for this, there are so many, many, many possible determinants in your wave function. Now, I would like to show you this with a stupid example. It's really stupid, but I like showing it because it really gives the, a feeling for, for the task at hand for doing this. Okay? So imagine we would like to do what I've just explained. We would like to understand the electronic properties of, say, a very easy molecule, a benzene molecule. Benzene molecule is just 12 atoms, six carbons. Oh, no. I really hate this thing here. OK. 
Okay, so we have six carbons, six hydrogens, 12 atoms, and there are 42 electrons around it. It's really something small. It's really, if you cannot do this, that, I mean, why are we talking about this? Okay, so let's try to do this benzene. As we have said, we have to solve the Schrödinger equation, H psi. We have seen what is, uh, what is the Hamiltonian is E psi. For the electronic problem only, we have taken away the nuclei. This here will depend on positions of uh, the 42 electrons which we have. Um, the Hamiltonian, we have seen it, is kinetic energy, interaction with the nuclei, and interaction between the electrons. This is all under control. But now here we have the sum of our possible determinants. Let's try to build those determinants. Well, to do this, we first have to find out the single particle orbitals. Which ones can we take? So we have to represent them in a computer. The easiest thing is to put a grid around your molecule and to say we store the value of an orbital at each point on the grid. Okay, so the, you have to describe uh, this lowercase phi of r, and at each point of your grid, you say it has that value, and you store this as an array in a computer. Okay, so you have 10 times, I mean, this would be even, one would certainly need a much finer grid, but just for fixing some numbers. Imagine we fix a 10 times 10 times 10, 10 grid, okay? So this means we have 1,000 grid points. On 1,000 grid points, you can create 1,000 linearly independent linear combinations of, of functions there. So we have, in principle, 1,000 single particle orbitals in our hand. Okay? 1,000 because we have chosen this. If you took a finer grid, you will have more possible wave functions. Okay? So, hop, next one. So we have 1,000 possible so-called basis functions. Then electrons also have kind of an angular momentum, doesn't matter, so something which we call a spin, which can always be either up or down. It doesn't matter very much what this is, but so in fact, since in each orbital you can put an electron up or down ways, we have in fact 2,000 so-called spin orbitals. But we have 42 electrons. So for each possible determinant, we have to choose out of 2,000, we have to choose 42. And now start choosing for, uh, 42 numbers out of 2,000. And you are in the unfortunate situation that you have three 10 to the 87 determinants. <laughs> and now you want to do your computer on your, your physics on a computer. So you will have to store those numbers C alpha for the determinants to, to characterize what is your electronic wave function. So you will have to store on the computer this huge amount of eight byte numbers. And what does this mean? So it's already clear, 10 to the 87, it's clear that it will not be possible, but just to show you what this would mean. So, okay? so these numbers here mean we have memory need of 2.5, 10 to the 79 gigabyte. However, a computer, today's computer memory is two gigabyte per square centimeter, typically. So we would need a computer memory which is one 10 to the 69 square kilometers. And given that the Earth's surface is only 5, 10 to the 9 square kilometers, and this includes all oceans and, and everything, this tells you that we need, in fact, um, 2.5, 10 to the 59 planets Earth of pure computer memory only to store a stupid electronic wave function for, um, for, for a benzene molecule. So, I mean, you see that this is what makes everything so complicated. It's trying to get a handle computationally on on, on quantum effects is so difficult because the wave functions are so horrible objects, okay? So, now I do not want you to think, okay, we forget about it and we cannot do wave functions. In fact, people can do wave functions. So quantum chemists have found ways around this. For example, one says, who needs, says that we need all these 10 to the 87 determinants? In fact, one of the most important approximations is to say, we take only one and we find out which is the most important. This is called Hartree-Fock. And then people find out, have very clever tricks of finding determin uh, important determinants with respect to unimportant determinants. So there are ways around this. But what I really would like to, to keep in mind is quantum mechanical wave functions in materials, they are a real problem. Okay? So the question is, could we do somehow this quantum mechanics without this horrible beast of the electronic wave function. We would like to treat the electrons quantum mechanically because we want to be able to describe chemistry, we want to know what happens when light shines on the electrons. We would like to do all this, but we would not like to deal with the many-body electronic wave function. And the answer is yes, this can be done. 
And this is called, the way this is done is called density function theory. And this theory is in fact the workhorse for what, what we people here are mainly doing. And uh, I will now try to explain you in fact the nature of it. So it says theory, and in fact it, DFT, so density function theory or DFT, is an exact theory. There's a theorem, this theorem can be proven, so all which you mathematicians like theorems, proofs, and so on, and there's even the question of existence appears, so things which mathematicians like. Okay, so let's look again at the Hamiltonian, in this case only the electronic one, which we have seen before. Okay, so we have, as said before, we have kinetic energy, we have interaction between the electrons, and we, the electrons interact with the nuclei. So this part here I would like to call an external potential. Why this? Because it depends obviously on uh, the positions of uh, the nuclei and where they are, but this is something which acts externally on the electrons. In fact, if you wonder, so you take this Hamiltonian here and you wonder in which way is this Hamiltonian different in a benzene molecule than it is in an ethene molecule or in a perovskite which we've seen. So you go to a different material, in which way are, ways are the Hamiltonians different? Well, they are different by what I've shown here in blue. The number of electrons is different if you go to a different material, okay? But then apart from the material, the number of electrons being different, there's also these things which are in green. It means the number the positions and the nuclear charges of the involved atoms. Okay? And you see that, in fact, apart from the number of electrons, all system-specific properties are all in this second part here. They are all in the external potential. All green parts are, in fact, here. So it is the external potential which is characteristic for system A or system B or system C. Okay? So, now, if we would like, for a given number of electrons, to calculate a property of the system, what we can do is, it is very difficult as I've shown, but what we can do is, we, once we know this external potential, so once we know the characteristic of the system, we can solve this Schrödinger equation. It will be very difficult on a computer as I've shown, but in, in conceptually, it's clear what we need to do. We have to solve the eigenvalue equation. It will give us a many-body wave function. And, uh, so this here comes here, we solve this many-body Schrödinger equation, we get this here. And once we have the wave function, we have in fact access to all properties of, uh, of the ground state of our system. In particular, we can calculate the charge density as a function of space, okay? So in fact, the density is related simply to the square norm of psi. If you're a mathematician, this is how I've written. You take this psi, if you know it, you simply have to integrate over all other positions. You take the first, the square of it, and this defines an electronic density at each point in space. So why I'm saying this? Well, this theory which I would like to say what this is called density function theory. So the, this is where the density will somehow be important in what I want to say. And so the important thing here is once you know the characteristic of your system due to an external potential, then there is a unique definition, uh, there is a unique charge density which you can obtain by doing these steps. So there is no doubt that one can go in this equation from left to right and obtain a charge density. Also note that the charge density is a very easy quantity. It is something which is always non-negative because it's uh, integral over some square, so it's always non-negative. And it's just a scalar at each point in space. So this is something you can really store easily in a computer, not like the many-body uh, wave function, okay? So this is an easy quantity, always positive, always real, and you can obtain it starting from the external potential. Now, what is density function theory? Density function theory is this other arrow. Density function theory is that not only when you know the external potential, you have clearly one density, but density function theory means that also the other way around is true. For a given density, there can be only one external potential which is related to it via the Schrödinger equation. So you can go this equation also the other way around. It seems like something impossible. How can such an easy thing here determine the wave function and everything else? But this is 
um, a theorem. So this is proven, it's called a hohenberg cohen theorem, which one can prove and everything. Yeah? And in fact, this theorem is worth a Nobel Prize. So Walter Cohen here, he won the Nobel Prize um, in chemistry for having proven this. Probably he would not have um, won it if he had only proven this and it would be useless, but he has won it because he's proven it and it proved so useful after all. Okay? So he won a Nobel Prize for doing this. I am, do not intend to, to prove it to here, even though it's really something which one can do in a few minutes. It's not a difficult proof, but so the important thing is there is a one-to-one -one relationship between this external potential which contains the system characteristics and the density. So, as, as I say here again, so since therefore from N you can get to V external, but from V external you can go to the wave function there to all properties, this means that all properties of the system are somehow or can be determined by the density alone, N of R. And as I say, this is a very easy quantity which you can easily store on, on a computer. So since all ground state properties are determined if you know the density, one of the properties is, for example, the energy of the ground state. So the energy, which is what we are always looking for, in fact, we know that it is determined if you know the density. So this, this theorem, this Hohenberg and Cohn theorem tells us that there must exist a functional which, given a density, gives you the energy. Okay? So n of r is a function, and the energy, therefore, is a function of this function, therefore, a functional. And uh, so this is why it's called density functional theory, because it proves or it, it says that there exists an energy function of the density which you have. So we know that this exists, and now the way forward is no longer solving the Schrödinger equation. It is something much easier. You take this functional here, and you minimize it, and that's it. Okay? So you take the functional. What do you do in the computer? You have an easy quantity like the density. You have some functional, you minimize it, and you get the ground state energy. And this is, in fact, what we are doing. So no, no treating wave functions anymore. We only work with the density. Um, so we know that it exists because Hohenberg and Cohn have proven it, this functional. But unfortunately, they have not given us <laughs> the ex exact form. And now, after many, many years of work and so on, it has been clear that it exists, but this E of n is certainly not an easy function which we can write down, or even if we knew it, it will certainly not be something easy to evaluate in a computer. So the big, one of the big challenges in our field is finding approximation to E of n. Okay? So I've decided later I have some slides if someone would like to know more about how this is approximated. There are, um, there are very clever ways, but I think EFT is also so useful because one can get easy to use, easy to implement approximation for this functional. And once we have an approximation for it, you just minimize and you get energy and so on. So this is what people, when they say, oh, we do quantum simulation, density functional theory based, this is it. No more wave functions, an approximation for a, an energy functional, and you minimize it to get the density and the energy of your system. So, there are a lot of very nice things about this. First of all, it is what we call ab initio. It means we do not need empirical information. No force field is actually, no one needs to say, ah, two carbon atoms always interact like this. No, we solve the electronic problem. And if the electrons want to make a bond, they do a bond. If they want to make a triple bond, they do a triple bond. If you pull the two atoms, the bond wants to break. It all comes out of density function theory. No empirical information is needed. Since you do not need empirical information, it has a very strong predictive power. This is what I've shown you in the beginning. You can really predict of materials of which you only know what is the charge, or the, you only know which elements are there, how many electrons, poof, you have, can do predictions. Okay? So it is a good predictive power. And very often, it is very, very accurate. So many, many properties we can calculate within very few percent, one, two percent, we can calculate many, many properties like lattice constants, like heats of formation. The kind of things I've shown you before can be calculated very accurately. And that many of these properties are also of technological interest. Okay. So we can calculate, so the energy, obviously, is what I've already shown you. 
The density comes out because the density is the one which minimizes the function, so we know the density. Since we have the energy, it's also normally very easy to calculate the derivative of the energy with respect to displace, displacement of an atom. This is the force on the nuclei. So once you have the forces, now you can move your atoms according to those forces and find where the force becomes zero. So we can find structures and equilibrium structures. You can also put your atoms away from the minimum position, get the forces, and solve Newton's equation and have what we call molecular dynamics. You can start making everything move around the temperatures and so on as you wish, because at each moment you can calculate quantum mechanically the forces which are there. Okay? So then we obtain eigenvalues. This is not important. So we have also frequencies. So once you are in, a, in, a, in an equilibrium configuration, the frequency is the second derivative, or which you obtain from the second derivative, like the forces from it. So you can take what we call phonons and vibrational properties. We can include the magnetic properties. People use it a lot for ferroelectrics, etc. So there are many, ex many exciting developments in this field, and I can really calculate today many, many properties based on density functional theory. And this is, in fact, as I said, what today many people are doing on, on the fastest computers you can imagine. We have some problems with it, obviously. So the problems are that it's still computationally intensive. It's not impossible. You didn't need 10 to the, I don't know what planet's Earth for a wave function, but still, it is much more intensive than if you just do a classical simulation with a force field. It's much more computationally intensive, but it, well, you get something back for it. And therefore, our systems are much smaller, say 1,000, 2,000 atoms, something like this. And the time scales, if you do a molecular dynamics, necessarily is also much shorter. Okay? So then we have a lot of other approximations. The main approximations rely on this function which I've shown you. And these approximations often are very good and sometimes they are extremely bad. So people like me who have been working for many years in this field have a feeling for when will your functional, the density functional theory results be um, reliable and when they are not. And in, unfortunately, in those materials which are often the most interesting ones, we get so-called strong correlation effects, and we get trouble with our approximations. Okay? Also, Van der Waals is something special. But I would like to show you, I told you this is a very quick expanding field. Many people are working there. And one measure how people in the science community measure the importance of a scientific work is by citations. No? Okay, so here you, um, in fact, this is what Nicola Mazzari, a friend of, uh, of mine, has done. He looked, in fact, in 2013, but it wouldn't have changed very much, at the most cited papers in, um, published by the American Physical Society. So the American Physical Society is the main body for where, where we will publish our results. And the most cited papers of all times here, number 1 to 22, are these. And now what I always find incredible comes in red, all the papers in red are related to what I've been talking to you. Hmm? So you see here, so these are here all approximations here, generalized gradient approximation made simple. This is one of the ways the density function of the, um, is approximated. It's called GGA, generalized gradient approximation. Then there are things uh, where this is applied to different things. Uh, and you see, for example, here, all these kind of things. And number 18 only is the atomic force microscopy. Or look here, uh, Baden Cooper Schrieffer, Nobel Prize for uh, who got the Nobel Prize for superconductivity is number 22. Okay, so I do not want to say that what we are doing is the most important and more important than superconductivity or whatever it is. But what I want to say is what this clearly shows is that a lot of citation means there are a lot of people working in this field. So this is really a field in rapid expansion. A lot of people there, therefore, a lot of citation and excitement. So this is not some fringe area of physics. This is really something which is in the heart of, um, of physical sciences. Okay? So I would also like to conclude by saying some things um, that, in fact, Trieste, so here our city, has for many, many years been a cornerstone of this area of uh, physical research. Why this? Well, because since many years there are research groups, well, here in ICTP in the condensed matter section, where, for example, I am a part of it, also in the applied physics section, which is here with, another, um, yeah, with our group. Then we have in CISA, since many years, uh, an important group doing uh, density functional theory based calculations. 
at the University of Trieste, there are also people in the chemistry department doing um, quantum chemistry on these things. Um, the CNA, the Italian National Research Council, has people here. They are mainly based at CISA, who are working in this field. So there are many research groups, and we are kind of a very li lively um, group of people doing, uh, doing things here in Trieste. Also, one of the most important discoveries, in fact, it was amongst the list which, has just, uh, which I've just fleshed up, is the so-called Caparinello method for doing molecular dynamics combined with density function theory. This has been invented here by Carr and Parinello and, uh, in 1985. So in 1985, um, there was not yet such a clear distinction between CISA and ICTP and so on. So I still, until now, I, I think one of them was in CISA, one was in ICTP also. But what is for sure, they were in these buildings when, in 1985, they invented their method. And when, in fact, Carr or Parinello, in fact, Parinello is in the ICTP Scientific uh, Council. Uh, Roberto Carr, and he is now in, uh, in Switzerland. Roberto Carr is now in Princeton. And they are very close friends to us. Uh, I'm a former student of Roberto Carr, for example. And when uh, they tell about this development of Caparinello here in Trieste, their stories always start by saying, oh, it was a particularly cold winter. And then they tell how strong the Bora was blowing in that winter. And they were working until later. And you see, they, and then they develop this f very, very famous thing, which brought them many, many scientific prizes and, and so on. So this was developed here. We are proud of it. Another very important thing, one of the computer codes which actually do density function theory is called Quantum Espresso. It's an open source code. Everyone can download it for free and use it. I'm also one of the developers of it. And it is, so it's used everywhere. And it's mainly developed here in Trieste by people. Just to show you again how important Quantum Espresso is, I, before coming down here, I looked at the citations of our main paper where we have written Quantum uh, what about this code. And you see, um, this paper has until now been cited 6,509 times. And you see, every year, this year is not yet over, so every year the number of citations is growing. So this code and DFT and so on is something which is in very good health and being used very widely. So you are in Trieste, so you can think you are really in one of the corners of a very important pillar of physical sciences. So with this, I think I can conclude and answer whatever questions you have. Oh, I cannot believe this. This was not planned. <laughs> it is on the minute exactly I conclude. <laughs>